Good evening, everyone. Good to see you here tonight. I hope everyone had a great Christmas. I'm glad you're back here to, uh, to join us for tonight's service. We're going to take one last opportunity to sing a couple of Christmas songs tonight, so let's stand and sing. The First Noel. Ken Barfoot, will you open us in a word of prayer, please, sir? Be seated. As Brother Keith says, good to see you guys this evening. I know that we have many who are out of town uh, this week. So many are gone with family and uh, vacationing and school is out. But we're glad that you're here and uh, able to worship with us in our midweek Bible study time. A couple of announcements. Uh, first, the precept of Bible study that Miss Joyce Fulton uh, teaches. It begins January the 16th. Uh, if you have not signed up and you are here tonight, please sign up. We're going to order books tomorrow as that will begin January the 16th. So uh, make sure you have signed up for that. If that is something that interests you, if you have any questions, Miss Joyce is here. 
uh, in the back and can answer any question that you may have. Uh, also, you'll see an email about this probably in the next week or so. Uh, our guide from Israel, Mark Zeiss, who is now in Ohio, where he's from, uh, is going to come down February the 18th through the 21st and is going to preach and teach uh, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Uh, we've invited him to do so. There will be a sign-up sheet about that. There will be a cost probably $30 a person to help with travel and the booklet that he's going to have for each person. Uh, I would highly recommend coming, okay? I know there's four nights uh, that you are going to be away from home and having to be here after a long day of work, uh, but he's a great Bible teacher, very knowledgeable, and uh, looking forward to having him here to be a part uh, of our time together. That will be in February. I will send that out uh, so you can make sure you have that on your calendar. Uh, other than that, are there any other announcements that need to be made? All right, we'll go into prayer request. I'll go ahead and mention the four or five that I have. Uh, Henry Deer will be having a heart procedure done tomorrow. Uh, to report at Baptist about 8.30. If everything goes well, he'll go home uh, tomorrow afternoon and milk it for the next couple of months. So if you'll be praying for uh, Mr. Henry, and uh, I, I said that because he told me he was going to milk it for at least two months, and uh, Miss Karen just back there smiling. But if you'll be praying for him, that's tomorrow at Baptist. Uh, Mr. Bill Pollard will be having a heart procedure done tomorrow at St. Dominic. It has to be there about 7.30, so if you'll be praying for Bill and Miss Kathy, I know they appreciate that. Uh, we laid to rest today, Gabby Buford, many of y'all have been praying for her uh, to be healed. She is absolutely healed now, and uh, we pray, pray for her family, continue to pray for the Buford family. I know they would appreciate that. Also, the Wilcox family, I mentioned last week, Greg Wilcox uh, lost his uh, 18-month-old grandson, almost two years old, but uh, that funeral will be Friday, so if you'll be praying for that family. And then I had a phone call from a church member today, and then these are prayers. We're going to leave that as an unspoken right now. Uh, so if you'll be praying for those, I know there are going to be others, but if you'll be praying for those families that are dealing with the death and uh, those that are dealing with surgeries and some upcoming tests that need to be done, I know they would appreciate that very much. We'll start here on my right, make my way across. Anybody on the right have any prayer requests? He's going to give you the microphone. I mean, you're plenty loud, but. Our son, Stephen Bell, he had a really tough few days, so if y'all would just keep him in your prayers. Sure. Miss Nancy Strick, Miss Nancy, Miss Tommy's son, Mr. Stephen Bell, have been praying for him uh, since as I've known them at this point, and uh, I don't mean that lightly, but he's had a rough couple of days with his cancer, so if you'll be praying for uh, Mr. Stephen and his family, and Miss Nancy, I know would appreciate that very much. All right, how about the middle? Anybody in the middle? Some of these people may not remember Miss Ruby Burns, but Joan Crenshaw, her daughter, called me today and said that Miss Ruby had fallen and she has a fracture, and they're not exactly sure where because it was over the holiday. And so just be praying for Miss Ruby as they get the care that they need and find out what's wrong. Is she in the hospital? She was, but she was in the emergency area, so I, I don't know. She was going to let me know. Okay. I'll try to find out and let you know tomorrow morning. Perfect. Yeah. Jelaine Hall mis mentioned Miss Ruby Burns. Miss Ruby, faithful member of the church many years, still a supporter, hadn't been here uh, in quite some time due to, to age, uh, took a fall, uh, has a fracture somewhere, don't know for sure, and currently in the emergency room at one of the hospitals. We're going to try to find that out. Uh, but if you'll be praying for Ms. Ruby Burns, uh, also Ms. Rose Blakeney, that's on my list, I forgot. Ms. Rose Blakeney uh, took a fall. They brought her in to Baptist, and uh, she had surgery on her hip, and uh, everything went as planned uh, or as, as yeah, they had hoped for. And so if you'll continue to pray for Ms. Rose and her time of recovery, I know that she'd appreciate that. Appreciate that. All right, go ahead, Richard. Our daughter-in-law father, Kurt Cunningham, is still in the hospital in, in Birmingham. He's... A maybe not any worse, but not, not a lot better than he was whenever he first went in, almost non-responsive. He still has a feeding tube. Uh, he's becoming combative because he doesn't like what they're doing. So they're going to, have to make some hard decisions coming pretty soon as far as extended care for him. So if you will, pray for Kirk Cunningham, please. Sure. Richard Gray mentioned there. Uh, Daughter-in-law's father, Mr. Kirk Cunningham, mentioned him a couple of weeks ago. Still in the hospital in, in uh, Birmingham and uh, not, not doing too good. So continue to pray for Mr. Kirk and that family uh, as they'll be making some decisions in the upcoming days. I know that uh, the family would appreciate that. Yes, ma'am.
Earl, I'm sorry. You're good. Uh, Earl Smith went to the doctor this morning, Dr. Mulholland, because he had strep. And he has been out of breath a lot lately. So the doctor checked him, and they set him up with the a cardiologist, and he is going to have a test, a, a heart test, on the 10th of January. So pray for Earl as he recovers and waits for this appointment. He's a little nervous about it. Sure. Jelaine mentioned Earl Smith. Um, uh, he's been having some issues with strep throat and some other things, but he has set up uh, for a cardiologist on January the 10th for some tests to be done. Uh, so we'll be praying for the po uh, Mr. I call him the Pope. Sorry, Mr. Earl. Uh, I know that he and Miss Pat would appreciate that. Anybody else in the middle? All right, left side. Right there behind you. One, yep. I have a friend, Nancy Kraft, is having a monitor put in her esophagus at 2 p.m. tomorrow at, I believe, believe, University. What's that last name? Nancy Kraft. Got it. Ms. Karen Dare mentioned Ms. Nancy Kraft will be having a procedure done tomorrow afternoon at UMC. So if you'll be praying for Ms. Nancy and the team of doctors and nurses uh, tomorrow. Yes, ma'am. Samantha Fields' brother, a brother-in-law, Jonathan Holmes, he didn't, <clears throat> the news she reported today wasn't very good. He really needs our prayers. Yeah, uh, Ms. Joyce has been mentioning uh, Ms. Samantha Fields, who, who attend our church, brother-in-law, uh, been going through some illnesses and some issues uh, medically. So if you continue to pray for him, I know that Ms. Samantha would appreciate it as Ms. Joyce gives us an update uh, about every week on that situation. The, the news that was given today uh, was not exactly what they were hoping for, uh, but the Lord's in control. So we're going to continue to pray for the Lord to have his way. Anybody else? All right, Rachel mentioned that she gets the results from the MRI from her neck tomorrow. So we'll be praying for good results for uh, Rachel Neal. Anybody else? All right, let's pray, and I'll turn it back over to Brother Keith. <clears throat> Lord, we love you, and we thank you uh, for the opportunity to gather this evening. Uh, God, we thank you for the Christmas season and the joy that it brings. And God, I know that it's difficult for some, but God, we thank you for what the season's all about. And God, we ask that you'll be glorified in all things. And God, thank you for sending your son uh, to be born and to walk the earth and to ultimately die for us. But God, thank you for the promise of his return and to be with him for all of eternity. And so, God, we ask that uh, that will be felt ever more by those who are dealing with the loss of loved ones during this time. God, we ask that you'll wrap your loving arms around them and comfort them the only way that you can. God, we have individuals who are, have upcoming tests uh, to be done. God, we're asking that your hand will be upon those results and upon those family members and those individuals, God, as they walk through this time of, in their mind, the unknown. Uh, God, we have many who are having surgeries, and we ask that everything will go smoothly. We pray for... Uh, and them individually and their families. God, we pray for the doctors that you'll guide their hands and grant them the wisdom that they need to take good care of our folks, God. And we ask that you'll just continue to make uh, your presence felt for them, God, as they've been dealing with uh, sickness for a long time. As we think about uh, Mr. Cunningham and we think about uh, Miss Samantha's brother-in-law, we pray that you'll be with them especially. God, we just thank you for knowing that we can approach your throne and you made that possible through the bloodshed of your son. And God, we thank you for the opportunity to proclaim your word through song and through the preaching this evening. And God, we pray that you open our hearts and minds, God, to uh, just absorb what's being sung and what is being taught, apply it to our lives, God, so that we can be uh, a better witness for you. God, we love you and we praise you. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, join me once again, if you would stand and sing with me, Silent Night, Holy Night.
All right, I know last week we began this study on atheism uh, and what that's all about, but I didn't think I was going to be here tonight, uh, and I am, obviously, I'm here, and uh, so I'm, I'm going to preach something a little bit different just because we'd already had it planned out uh, of what we're going to do as far as atheism. So uh, I wrote this message over the last couple of days and uh, tweaked a little bit, and I've entitled it, Reaching, it, Reaching Ahead in the New Year. And I want to look at Philippians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church of Philippi. And I think there's three things that we can see here in the first few verses of Scripture uh, that we're going to look at that gives us goals and things that we should shoot for, whether it be young people, middle-aged people, senior adults, or everything in between. Look with me in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus." It's hard to believe that Christmas has already come and gone, right? It's hard to believe that 2023 is almost coming to an end. Maybe for some, you're excited that it's coming to an end. Hopefully, a new year is coming. Maybe it's been a great year for you, and you wish it could continue. We look at that many different ways. We think about all the preparations that we have for the Christmas season, whether it be our gifts or our meals or our families or our friends or everything uh, coming and spending time together only to be taken down so quickly. And here we are in that limbo period, right? Well, I call that the limbo period, where you don't know if you're supposed to continue to sing Christmas songs, or you're supposed to move ahead a little bit, or do you preach on Christmas, or do you preach on New Year? And so the idea is, you know, what are we to do? Well, 2024 is a time that many folks, maybe you this evening, are going to say, I'm going to make some New Year's resolutions, right? And we're going to say, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm not going to do. I'm going to make resolutions, and we make those resolutions for a very simple reason. Many times when we say, I'm going to make a resolution, we are saying that because we realize that there are things that we're not doing that we should be doing, or there are things that we're not doing as good as we could be doing, and so we make a resolution that says, I'm going to do better because I know I'm slacking here or there. Let's think about some of the common resolutions you're going to see on social media when people post, new year, new me, right? I, I want to lose some weight. I want to exercise more. I, I want to go to the gym. I want to eat better. I, I want to read my Bible more. I want to attend church better. I want to be a better husband, a better father. I want to be a better a student. I want to be a better friend, a coworker. All of those things you're going to hear people say over the next five or six days, I can assure you. And, and their goal is to, to fulfill the things that they are saying, whether it be going to the gym, eating better, reading the Bible, whatever it, it may be. But I've learned that resolutions sometimes come and go, uh, that our commitments are sometimes only for a season. And the passage of Scripture we see in Philippians chapter 3, uh, Paul makes it clear. He gives us three things, and I'm going to show you three main points, that we can make sure that our lives are counting for the kingdom. Not that our lives are counting for ourselves or our own desires or what we want, but that our lives are being impactful for the kingdom. And the first thing that we see in Philippians chapter 3 is that Paul possessed a purpose. Paul possessed a purpose. You have a purpose, right? Many of you would agree with that. Many of you that are older individuals would say, hey, this was my purpose. I know this is what God wanted me to do for maybe 40 years, and now God has me doing this or God has me doing that. Maybe teenagers down here, some of them know for a fact what they want to do and say they're going to school for this or they're going to school for that. Or maybe they're just going to school to get away from the parents and it's going to take them five years to get a degree, right, Dylan? So the idea is understanding that not everybody understands their purpose in life. But the Bible says that we all have a purpose, and our purpose is to bring honor and glory to Jesus. It might be through being an emergency room doctor, as I know some want to be, or a teacher, or a coach, or you fill in the blank there. But we have a purpose, and Paul shows us the purpose of our life in verse 12. Look with me again. It says this, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. That's an important phrase there. If that I may apprehend that which for which also I am apprehended of Christ. 
In verse 12, we see Paul's main desire. In verse 12, we see Paul's purpose. He wanted to grow in the Lord. He wanted to grow in his faith. He wanted to grow in his walk with Christ. And as every Christian you're sitting here today, in this evening, your New Year's resolution, your commitment should be every day, I want to be more like Jesus. I want to grow in my faith. I want to grow in my prayer walk. I want to grow in my evangelism style. I want to grow in what God is calling me to do. And during this time, normally from December 26th to December 31st, we have that time frame of, hey, what do I want my New Year's resolutions to be? And as you think about that, I want to give you some guidelines that I call guidelines, and a couple of these are definitely toward me for sure, some guidelines on goal setting or resolution making so that you can possess a purpose in your life beginning today ultimately, but the goal is reaching into the new year. First of all, to have a purpose, we need to have the right goals. Our goals need to be the right goals. Well, what does that mean? Uh, what does that mean? What is Paul saying in Philippians chapter 3? What, what do you want to see happen in 2024? Well, let's think about a couple of scenarios that may fit some of you this evening and myself. Well, if you're unsure that you're saved and you're not sure that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, hey, don't wait till January the 1st, 2024, okay? Let's go ahead and get that taken care of today. Maybe that is my new life needs to be a transformed life. Maybe I need to understand Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, that I am transformed, I'm no longer conformed, and, and my life is a living sacrifice that brings honor and glory to the Lord. So maybe our goal needs to found, be, be based upon salvation. Maybe it's a bad habit. Uh, maybe you struggle with gossip. Maybe you struggle with alcohol. Maybe you struggle with pornography. Maybe you struggle with uh, nicotine. Maybe you struggle with you fill in the blank. It's a bad habit, and you say, you know what, I just can't kick it. You're right, you can't by yourself, but with the Lord, you can do it. With the Lord, you can walk away from those things that used to define you. With the Lord, you can say, hey, I'm not going to do this anymore, so our goals need to be there. Maybe it's, and this is one of my favorites when I was working on this, is, is fellowshipping with the brethren. You know, I often think, you know, how many people miss what the church is all about for only coming at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. You're probably thinking, man, you ought to be preaching that on Sunday morning, not on a Wednesday at 6.30. But how many folks miss what the church can offer, right? I'm not saying you come here for what the church offers, but you miss so much by not being a part of a Sunday school or a Wednesday night midweek Bible study or a time of discipleship training or training union like many of you guys called it back in the day. But the time for us to study in God's Word and walk through life together. Maybe it's a time that you need to reach people for the gospel. Maybe there are people in your life that you know is lost and going to hell. I can give you an individual uh, that I had a conversation with not long ago, and he looked at me to my face and said, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. I don't want anything to do with religion. That's as real as the rain. I could give you the person's name as he is somebody well-known in our city. But the idea is there are people who need Jesus, and they don't want to hear from the preacher. They don't want to hear from the music minister. They want to hear from somebody that cares. They want to hear, not that we don't care, but they want to hear from somebody that says, hey, you know what, they're not expected to do it. That come off bad. But they're not expected to tell us about the gospel. But it's somebody who, who says, you know what, I'm worried about your eternal security. I'm worried about your salvation. You know, I think about that. I wrote this yesterday and went to Pine Lake today for at Gabby's, and I was in there for the family visitation, and I walked in, and, and this is an incredible story. I told Keith a minute ago, and I'm going to get chills again. And I was talking to David and Kim, and I don't know if, if, if you've had the opportunity to meet Gabby. She was an absolute saint. I mean, she absolutely loved Jesus. It was unbelievable. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. But David was telling me that uh, they pulled me to the side, and they were telling me that over the last couple of weeks, if you've seen her, she could barely open her eyes. Her right eye had almost gone completely shut. She couldn't do anything with her right hand anymore, and and she was just struggling. At the end of the day, she was struggling. But they said that she was sitting there that last night, and she kind of perked up, right? She kind of perked up and said, hey, it's time to go, per se, or here it is. And, he, and she reached out with her right hand and grabbed her dad. And, and then, David's tears in his eyes, he says, she looks dead ahead, and she reaches If that don't tell you what heaven's going to be like, I don't know what is. You know what I mean? Because I can, tell, I can assure you this, not everybody gets to reach and put their hand in the hand of the Savior. Not everybody does. There's no doubt in my mind that a couple of days ago, that young 13-year-old girl 
is in the presence of Jesus. There's no doubt in my mind. And we think about that now. Maybe you have family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, people that you see day in and day out who do not know Jesus as their Savior. Maybe your goal needs to be, I need to spend more time in the Word. Maybe I need to study it more. You know, I, I've been in one of those ruts before, nothing against this, don't think I'm being disrespectful, where I'll grab my devotional and I'll, and I'll read one little page of my devotional and I'll pray for about two or three minutes and then I go about my way. There's nothing wrong with that, don't mishear what I'm saying, but sooner or later you've got to have that desire where you want more, where you want to spend a little bit more time. Instead of 10 minutes, you want 20. Instead of 20, you want 30, where you're wanting to grow in your faith, you're wanting to grow. There's nothing against wrong, there's nothing wrong with open windows, okay? There's nothing wrong with what we give out to you guys. But what I'm saying is maybe maybe you haven't had a quiet time, and you say, hey, you know what? I need to spend time with the Lord. Or maybe it's, hey, you know what? I haven't really tithed like I'm supposed to. You may say, well, of course you're going to throw that in before you go there. No, I'm talking about your talents. I ain't just talking about your money here. There's a lot of folks that sit here week after week who can sing. Man, use your abilities to sing praises to the Lord. There are folks who can teach. Use your abilities to bring praise to the Lord. Our goals need to be the right goals. Maybe you're struggling as a husband. Maybe you're struggling as a wife. Maybe you're struggling as a young person. Maybe you're struggling as a brother or a sister, and you need those deficiencies to be corrected. God can make sure that happens. Not only do we need to have the right goals, but I believe our goals need to be specific. You know, we often have the, the vague goals. Lord, let me, let me eat better, right? Lord, I want to be a better person, right? Lord, just let me be a better person. No, there's nothing wrong with that, but be specific. Lord, I need to show love better. Lord, I need to show grace better. Lord, I need to show forgiveness better. Lord, I need to stop worrying about things that I can't control. Lord, I need to submit to you. Lord, no, it's not that I want to read my Bible more. No, Lord, I want to read my Bible through in 2024. I want to spend time in the Word. Lord, I want to share the gospel with at least X amount of people a week or X amount of people a month. Lord, I want to share the gospel with this family member or this coworker. When you start writing these things down, we're going to look at that here in just a second, but when you start writing these things down and you see it over and over and over again, it, it, it kind of motivates you to do it a little bit more. Our goals need to be specific. And third, I put this in there because this is my personal uh, conviction, our goals need to be written down. They need to be written down. You know, so every year I'll write down what, I have five goals. When I started as a pastor in 18, I had five goals uh, for this church in the first five years. The first goal was to make it through the first year alive, if you want to know exactly what it was, what I wrote down. I mean, I wrote that down, true story. But then it was to become more of a, a Great Commission church. It was absolutely that. It was to change the bylaws and be more mission-minded with the deacon serving and maybe an elder group or a leadership team doing this. And then the, the, the final goal was how can we be more intentional, right? How can we get older folks paired with younger folks for discipleship? How can we get older folks involved that's not involved, younger folks that's not involved, involved? And, and we need to be specific. We need to have achievable goals, and we need to write those down. When, when you write something down and you see it every day, right, and, and, and you think about it every day, then you think about the importance of it. We have some folks in our church that come in, I would say, every couple of months, and they straighten up the back of the back of the chairs, right? They, they put new envelopes in, they put pens in, and, and they're here forever. Like, it takes them forever uh, to do this. And, and one of the ladies brought me a decision card, and I have it to this day. And, and if Marley wrote Marley, I don't even know if Lindsay knows this, but wrote Marley and that she put the check that I want to accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Now, when she did that, I have no idea. But I look at that every day, right, to say, hey, my discipleship starts in my home first before it starts in a church. And for me to see that is to make me be more intentional with all three of them at this point, right? That radically changed. But the idea is to say, hey, this is what I'm called to do. And so when we write those down, it shows accountability. It says, you know what? I care enough to write it down so that I can be committed to it, so that I can follow through with it, so that can I can examine myself to make sure that I have kept my commitments. The final one is one that we probably all need to do a little bit better of is our goals need to be realistic. Need to be realistic. You, you ever had expectations put on you that were impossible to, to feel, fulfill? Absolutely. That none of you have an expectation of me 
that trumps my expectations of me, I can assure you, right? None of you. It doesn't matter who you are. I expect of myself far more than what you can expect of me. But there are times that my expectations of myself or my expectations of anybody else are not real. There, there's no way somebody can do it. There's no way that I can do it. There's no way that I can be at two places at the same time, right? So we need deacons. We need people willing to serve, which is going to be a beautiful picture of what's going to happen tomorrow for our church and individuals having surgeries at two different times at two different hospitals, and our guys are going. But the idea is, hey, I want to read my Bible for three hours a day. That's probably not going to happen. Laura, I, I want to give 60% of my income. I'm not saying that can happen, but that's probably not going to happen. Uh, Lord, I want to I, I want to read the Bible through four times next year. If you do that, I want to figure out how you do it, right? It's hard enough for me to do it one time, much less four times. Lord, I want to share the gospel with somebody every single day. And that's probably realistic, but let's be honest, that's not something we're going to follow through. But our realistic goal should be something like this. Hey, I'm going to go to church and be the church instead of complaining about what the church is not doing. That's a good realistic goal. Hey, I'm going to go to church and I'm going to give my time. I haven't sang in the choir in 20 years, but the Lord's really convicted me. I'm going to get up there and sing in the choir. Or I haven't taught in, in 30 years, but the Lord's laying on my heart to teach, and I want to I wanna go and teach. Or maybe I want to serve in the kitchen, or I want to do whatever it may be. The goals need to be realistic. Paul possessed a purpose. And Paul said, with my purpose, I'm going to make sure my goals are realistic. I'm going to make sure my goals are written down. I'm going to make sure that my goals are specific. And I'm going to make sure my goals are right based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has a purpose. And this is my favorite point. This next point is my favorite point of this message. Paul had, or Paul possessed a plan. Paul possessed a plan. Nothing makes me more mad than when somebody don't have a plan. When we're going to just wing things. It drives me absolutely insane. Like I can feel my blood pressure climbing before anybody says anything, right? I mean, I just, I just can't. Me and Keith have a conversation. Keith's like, man. I, I'm flexible. I'll do whatever. I'm thinking to myself, no. <laughs> what do you mean you're flexible? Like, no, right? It's good we're not the same in that regard, right? But but the idea is kind of like what? But a plan. Paul, there's nothing wrong with being flexible. But Paul possessed a plan. And I want you to see these two things in verse 13. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. P pay attention now. This is very important. Brethren, he's talking to Christians, okay? He's talking to, like, it's like me talking to you. I'm not saying I'm the apostle Paul. But he's talking to believers. I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Here it is. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Paul had a plan. Paul had a strategy. Paul had a plan and a strategy to accomplish his goal. What was Paul's plan? Here's the very first sub-point there. He had to forget the past and reach for the future. Let that sink in, because there's people in this room that needs to forget the past and reach for the future. You've been holding on to bitterness for a long time. You've been holding on to hatred for a long time. You've lived in a cloud of past failure, past regret, and you, you just can't seem to get past that hurt. You can't seem to get past that bad decision. You can't seem to get past that valley of your life. Listen to what verse 13 says. Matt, put that back up. I know it's not in my notes in this order. Look at what it says in verse 13. Forgetting those things which are behind. Let me encourage you what that means. If God puts your past failures behind you, you can put your past failures behind you. That's what that means. That means that you don't have to worry about the bonehead decision. Now, there are consequences. Don't miss, it. Don't miss that. But you don't have to worry about the bonehead decision that you made 20 years ago, a year ago, five years ago, 40 years ago. Put it behind you. Because if you don't, if you continue to live in the past of regret, you're setting yourself up for failure, period. Because you cannot move forward. You can't release those things and reach for the another. When you understand this, here's the good news that I believe Paul's telling us this. The past is the past for a reason. You know, we hear the old cliche, there's a reason why your windshield's bigger than your rearview mirror, right? We, we understand those things. Logical point there. I'm not going to use one of those corny jokes there. But the idea is, hey, the, the future is brighter, the future is great. Why? Because the future is heaven right? The future is your eternal security. Stop worrying about those things and start moving for the future. There are many folks in this church who cannot move forward because they're still holding on to things from 10 years ago. 
They're still holding on to things from 20 years ago that maybe a mom did, a dad did, a friend did. Hey, guys, let go of the past and reach for the future. The second thing that Paul did, the second thing that we see here is that he pressed toward the mark of the high calling of Christ. He pressed toward the mark of the high calling of God. His plan, Paul's plan, was to let go of the past, reach for the future, and to move to the calling that God had on his life. It is to go where God wanted him to go. He formulated a plan to say, I'm not who I used to be. Well, who did Paul used to be? You may say, well, that's easy for you to preach that. That's easy for, for Paul to say that. No, let me tell you what Paul used to be. Go up a few verses of Scripture in verse 6. Now listen. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the right, righteousness which is the law, blameless. So when you move down, that's important, when you move down to verse 13 and Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching those things which are before, when he pressed toward the high calling of Christ, Paul in his mind is saying, hey, i got to quit worrying about the persecution that I did for the church because the Savior of the universe has forgiven me and I'm going to move forward to be what God has called me to be. That's what Paul's saying there. Hey, you may say, well, Paul didn't deal with what I dealt with. What does that even mean? What does that even mean? This dude was killing Christians. Seven verses prior, he's worried about what he was doing years ago, but then he sits there in the boldness, being fulfilled of the Spirit, and says, hey, you know what? I don't have to worry about the past. I'm going to put the past behind me, and I'm going to move forward. I'm going to conquer the guilt. I'm going to conquer the pain. I'm going to conquer the bitterness. I'm going to conquer the animosity, and I'm going to focus on Jesus so that God is glorified and my plan it's kept. In other words, Paul says something like this. I haven't fully arrived where I'm supposed to be spiritually. I don't think anybody does until they see Jesus, if you understand that context there. But I've identified my goal. My goal, as Apostle Paul is speaking, if I could put it in my language, my goal is spiritual growth. I know that the barrier that has kept me from being who God wants me to be is my past guilt, my past of frustration in my past life. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the past behind me once and for all so that I can reach for the future that God has for me. And when I reach for the future that God has for me, I'm going to press toward that mark with persistence and fortitude. Many of us have this plan. We say, hey, I'm going to go to the gym. Hey, I'm going to read my Bible. Hey, I'm going to evangelize more until the one day that we don't want to get out of the bed. Or until the one time we have the conversation with somebody and they tell us they don't want what we have. Or until we're rejected by sharing our gospel. And then what do we do? Instead of going with persistence, we back off. And we say, okay, well, maybe I don't need to do this. Maybe that's a spirit telling me that I don't need to go about it this way. No, no, no. It might be a spirit, but it's the wrong spirit. You know what I mean? God says you got to be persistent. The apostle Paul says, let go of the past, move to the future. How do you do it? Scripture. How do you get past the past? Look at Scripture for the present and the future. How do you get past uh, having a bad temper? You look at the Scripture by controlling your tongue. How do you get past the hurt and the bitterness that you possess of those who've hurt you? You find the Scripture about forgiveness. Having a plan is a great idea. It's only good when you put that plan in action, though. Only good when you put that plan in action. I love watching college basketball. used to love it a lot more than I do now. But I love watching a, a true full-court press, if you all know what that is, right? Like, you just stay with me. I, I love watching people know where to go, right? When the ball comes in off the baseline, this guy does this, this guy does that. that you probably think of some of you like, well, who cares? But I love when, when that's written down and, and they fulfill it, right? It's like Christian Leitner's last shot at the free throw line, if you all remember that shot back in the day. That's the Duke Blue Devils, the only basketball team out there. But the idea is, I love seeing a plan come to fruition. But then you, you draw the plan up, you practice the plan, and then somebody botches it, right? Like football, here's the, here's the, the offense we're going to run, the defense we're going to run, and somebody misses their assignment, what happens? You got six points on the board. And so then we say, you know what? What did I do wrong? How did I mess up? Sometimes our plan are selfish oriented, sometimes our goal only benefits, listen, you. Sometimes all our wants or what we pray for is what I want. 
Sometimes our plans should be for the betterment and the benefit of those around us. Paul says that. Paul makes it clear. Paul possessed a plan. Paul possessed a purpose. Number three, Paul possessed persistence. Paul possessed persistence. Final point. Chapter 3, verse 12 of Philippians. Not as though I had already attained, either already perfect, but I follow after, it that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. That phrase, I follow after, in the Greek, carries the idea to pursue, to follow eagerly, to endeavor earnestly, to acquire. So what does that mean? What Paul has in mind an image of a Greek runner sprinting down the race course. He's trying to keep up with the chase. He don't want to be left behind. He's pressing toward the fixed goal. I can remember when I played high school basketball, we used to have to run a suicide in 26 seconds, if you know what that is. Burkhaven Academy had a college basketball court, and I can remember so many times diving head first from the free throw line because if we didn't make it in 26 seconds, we'd have to, the whole team had to run it again. Well, I didn't want to be that guy. 26 seconds is not the easiest thing to do when you're as big as I am and playing basketball. But the goal was 26 seconds. The goal was to win. The goal was to be the best. The goal was perfection. I watched Remember the Titans last night. Great movie, by the way. And we see there that the coach demanded perfection. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And he, he wants you to be perfect. And, and the, they get in there when they bring the schools together, consolidate the schools, and, and, and he stands up and he says, Coach, you've demanded us to be perfect. And as a team, it's what he says, we are perfect. You know what that means? When Jesus is on your side, you're going to be okay. When it's you by yourself, it's not going to be good. You're moving toward the goal. You're pushing for completeness. You're pushing for success. Look at verse 13 again. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. This one thing I do. That phrase is important too. That means steadfastness. That means you have a single-minded determination. When somebody tells me I can't do something, I'm going to show them that I can. When somebody tells me that it's impossible, I'm going to prove them to be wrong. Paul says that your single-minded here in this point of Philippians chapter 3, 13 through, 12 through 14, is that you're pressing toward the high calling, that you're forgetting about the past and focusing on the future, and you're reaching forth means to stretch forth after. What I think Gabby did when God called her home, right? She stretched forth toward the hand of God. Many of you are stretching toward the wrong things. Many people in the church were, were stretching forth this or that. Paul says you got to be stretching forth the gospel, that you have to be persistent, that you have to have an iron-willed determination, that we need to master discouragement, that we need to focus on our goals even when we're down, even when we're discouraged, even when we are ridiculed. Someone once said, great people are not naturally great. They are just ordinary people with an extraordinary amount of persistence. In other words, odds stacked against them, and they're going to show you what they got. Not able to do it, they're going to prove it. Hey, it's a new year. Here it comes in the next four or five days. Hashtag new year, new me. That's such garbage. I'm just saying. I mean, get off the social media, folks, and just start focusing on Jesus. Right? I'm, I'm not, I mean, I post, you understand. Stop posting where everybody can see what you want to do. It don't matter what you do, folks. What matters is what Jesus is doing through you. That's all that matters. Don't set goals you're not going to follow through. Don't have ideas that you're not going to do. If you're going to use a social media platform to share the gospel, you show us some media platform to share the gospel. But what I'm trying to tell you is don't try to seek the accolades of man. We have ideas, but we fail. We have great plans only for them not to come to fruition. We have great desires, but we have no desire for those desires to come true. So what do we do? We reach into the new year with a plan, with a purpose, and with persistence. Our life is to be a plan. What's the plan? Well, Jeremiah 29 11 tells us that God has a plan for us. I don't know what your plan is. I don't know what my plan is. But the totality of our plan is to live a life for Jesus so that we're here one day, well done, good and faithful servant. I can tell you that based on the gospel. Your plan may take you via California. Mine may take me via Washington, D.C. But the end goal is the kingdom. Agreed? Agreed may take you longer to get there than it does me. That's okay, too. That's called persistence. 
That's called never giving up. That's called never turning your back on the one. Listen, because God never turned his back on you. That's never saying they're too far gone. They're too old. They'll never accept Jesus. They'll never change. It's not your job or your call to say whether or not someone's going to change. It is your job and your call to encourage that change. Absolutely it is. Reaching into the new year. I'm excited for what the new year has. I am. I'm excited for what the Lord's going to do in this church. The Lord's working. The Lord is moving. We've had the most baptisms we've ever had this year. Most new members we've ever had this year. All those things are great, but we're not finished. We're not finished. 75%, 80% of this county is unchurched. I play golf with 20 folks every Sunday or every weekend. I don't play on Sunday much anymore, about every seventh or eighth one. And I'd venture to say out of those 20, maybe four attend church, and two of us are in here, right? And there are people you work with, there are people you go to school with that need Jesus. Reach into the new year, burden for the lost. Here's what I would tell you. Lord, give me a burden for those who are lost. And when you can't go to sleep at night because all you can think about is that person, then you know you got the right goal. Then you go, then you know you got the right mindset. Then you follow through with persistence to see that person come to know Jesus. Reach into the new year with a purpose, a plan, and persistence. Let go of the past, focus on the future. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the gospel. God, we thank you for the Apostle Paul being able to sit there or state in bold with complete boldness. I'm going to quit worrying about the regrets of the persecution of the church in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, and I'm going to put the past behind me, and I'm going to reach forward. Not only am I going to reach forward, I'm going to press toward the high calling that you have for my life so that I can be what you want me to be. God, may that be our prayer. May our prayer be that we are being who you have called us to be, living a life that you called us to live, serving in a way that you've called us to serve, encouraging those that need encouraging, loving the unlovable, guiding those who need guidance. But God, most importantly, God, put us in your will. God, let us be where we need to be. Guide us where we need to be. God, may we remain faithful. God, pray that you keep us safe this evening. Pray that you be with us the remainder of the week. God, pray that you continue to guide, guard, and direct us. So we'll be careful to give you all the praise, honor, and glory for it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.